Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, welcome in, Winning Cures Everything. I'm Gary. I'm Chris. We have got uh, quite a bit to discuss. We are recording on Sunday night. Uh, Before we get into all of that, of course, the show is brought to you by Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. they got six incredible sports books, along with a ton of shows coming through town, a bunch of really, really good um, uh, steakhouses, golf courses, etc. You can find more information on all of that over at tunicatravel.com. So make sure that you go check that out. You can find us over at uh, winningcureseverything.com. All of our picks, previews, podcasts, videos, social media platforms. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Make sure you leave a comment. Uh, tell us your opinions, your thoughts on these topics as well. We love to hear from you guys. If you're listening on the podcast, make sure you hit subscribe for us. Uh, that helps out more than you know. Leave a nice review, especially if you're on Apple Podcasts. Uh, let's go ahead and run into this thing. Of course, got to start out with the uh, the somber news of Sunday. It kind of took over the sports world. It took over the uh, entertainment world. The Grammys, of course, are going on right now. Uh, rest in peace, Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant was killed in a helicopter crash in Calabasas, uh, in California. Uh, he and four others, his daughter was on board, uh, a baseball coach and his wife and daughter, they were traveling to a competitive basketball game for his daughter, for a, a girls' team. And he's kind of been an ambassador for the women's game as of late. Like, over the last month, he's really jumped into that. Have you noticed that, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's spending a lot of time there. But that's, I mean, he's got a vested interest in it Yeah, with uh, with his kids. So he, uh, he leaves behind a legacy of, I mean, I wrote down competitive intensity and skill that we have only ever seen in one other player, I believe, Michael Jordan, and will likely never see again. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah, I just think that that people are wired different today than they they used to be. No, nobody has that killer instinct anymore. Everybody, or, or know, even if they have the killer instinct, they don't have the skill to be able to do it. Right? Yeah, but I I just I kind of think that killer instinct is gone. I I think so too. Like, I mean, I think it's going to be far more rare than it ever used to be. And then much less finding somebody who has the ability and that kind of instinct married together again. Yeah. It's just it's just not it's well, just it's, not realistic. It, it was more than a game to to him and to Michael Jordan. It I mean, he took every game like it was the last game he was gonna play. You know, and, and you just don't find that nowadays. People, you know, people rest more, there's load management now. There's a like Kobe didn't until his injuries like he just didn't miss games. Like, and people will talk about, oh, well, that was the era then, and this is the era now, and if he played today, he would. I, I just I think disagree. I think most of the other players around him would have. I don't think he would have, and I don't think Michael would have. I agree. I just I just think those guys are wired different. And, and I, I know – I'm wearing my Pats gear. It, it, I, like, I think Tom is a lot like that. I know there's a ton of Patriot haters out there that would probably disagree with that, but he's the same thing, though. All he does is eat, sleep, and breathe his job, and and he's made umpteen sacrifices to just get a little bit better, and it's the only thing that matters to him is just winning. It's just that killer instinct of just destroying people, and he, you know, yeah. they never want to come out of the game. Ever. He he wanted to go out and and make you pay for daring to line up against him every single night. And, you know, the the 60-point game in his last regular season game against the Jazz uh, was, at, like, I will never forget that. It, it was it was incredible television. Um, I don't know that we're going to see a lot of guys, because most guys hang on until it is way past their prime, right? You don't see guys that just know when it's time Ooh, I don't know. I think the guys make too much money now. I think you're going to see guys get out way earlier. You might be right, but we haven't seen it yet. You know, it, guys hang on a little too long all the time. Stars because, maybe. Stars yes, maybe. That's what I'm saying. Like a, a superstar that that knows that he could go somewhere else and make however umpteen million dollars. Because why would you leave when you're when even if you're not getting a big-time contract, 
you can still go out and make $10 million a year playing 50 games. You know, yep. like it's nothing. So it's it's a little bit different. But he, that last regular season game, he scored 60. And, yeah, it took a lot of shots to get there, but it was riveting television. Well, it was um, Kobe. Yeah, it was Kobe. I mean, it was just fantastic. That, that farewell I mean, he tour, trusted the whole himself. Thing. with People call him a ball hog back in the day, but he trusted himself with the ball more than he trusted you. Yeah. You know, uh, he, getting uh, you a shot, uh, you drop the shots and I'll get you the ball. Exactly. You, you miss one, you're done. He uh, he played 20 seasons with the Lakers. That's something else that uh, that you're not going to see a whole lot of. You know, guys like Dirk Nowitzki, stuff like that. Uh, even Michael Jordan ended up closing his career with the Washington Wizards. Kobe opened with the Lakers, closed with the Lakers. Uh, it was, you know, it's a different time, different era. Uh, you're not going to see that kind of stuff anymore. Like maybe Steph Curry stays a warrior forever. Um, but other than that, I mean, guys are moving all the time just at trying to chase rings. And can he play 20 years? Yeah. I don't know of many guys that will play 20 years. You know, Vince, yeah, man, Vince Carter is... Time. Vince Carter has done it for, you know, quite a while now. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. It's interesting. He, he was one of the last few to get in at, uh, out of high school. Yeah. So that helps him. You know, he doesn't have that extra year that some of these other guys have. That's true. That's true. Uh, tons of teams today were taking 24-second and 8-second violations to, uh, to start the games. Uh, the Grizzlies did it against the Suns. You know, the Grizzlies took a 24-second clock violation and then the Suns took an eight-second violation to try and get it over half court. Um, the Mavs have announced they are retiring the number 24. Do you think at some point the NBA is going to retire uh, one of these numbers? I guess number 24, that's what he's most known for. I don't know that I would do that. I just don't. I don't know what the symbolicness is, you know? I mean, is he a yeah. great player? Sure. But there's only one number in all of sports that's retired across every team in that sport, and that's 42 for Jackie Robinson. Yeah, and that's a little different. I, I think you, I think you kind of, I don't know, discredit a that being hung in the rafters of the the Staples Center for the Lakers, you know, by by just saying, well, we're gonna we're gonna you know do that too. You know, I, 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 agree I don't know you. that the league has to do that because he passed away. Would you have done it if he was still alive? Would you have done it if he lived to be 80 and was the greatest ambassador in the history of the game for the sport? Would you so. still have done it? Because I don't think so. I, I think the the tragicness of the moment uh, has like kind of got to the Mavericks. You know, yeah. and this is obviously. And I no get that. If you're close to him and you know him, right now you're not thinking straight. Any decision you make is going to be knee jerk, even if it's the right decision or the best decision in the world. It's still a a just a reaction to your whole life being shaken. It it really surprised me. You know, the there were several outlets that did you know the ten best players of uh, of the decade, right, or the ten yeah. best all time NBA players, and several of those lists didn't even have Kobe Bryant on it which made no sense to me. Um, but, it, you know, they would have guys like Steph Curry. And and LeBron James, I think, belongs on there. But to not have Kobe Bryant on some of those lists was insane. I mean, he was – everybody – when you when you took a shot, and it's, it's a tradition thing. Like, it, you've played basketball for years. Uh, even when you're just taking a shot in the driveway, it, you step back and you're, you're acting like the shot clock's counting down, you know, 3-2-1, and you'll yell Kobe. Right, like everybody did that, and I don't know that that will ever change. You know, like I, I would hope that 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 kind of thing would continue because that's, you know, it for whatever reason it just caught on even back when we were in high school, yeah. and well, it was when he was a mega star in the game. Yeah, so, so like take, there's, there's take even little the tragedy now. That take the tragedy of today out of it. If you were ranking just from 2011 until. 2020 was Kobe one of the best 10 players in that decade on his performance in those years? The answer is probably not. I, I would say yes. I mean, he won, you know, I would have to, I would have to go back and look. Cause I don't really, he won two championships. Like, I, Oh, then yeah, no, then, yeah. then it's over. <laughs> no, then it's over. I don't, I don't know when they last won championship 10 years ago. Seems like it was five minutes ago. The older I get. So. I know, right. I mean, it's 2000, just, 2011 seems like it was just around the corner. And I was like, man, he blew an Achilles. He missed an entire year. Like, how much of the decade did he actually play? Yeah, you know, no, I, I understand. 
I, I feel where you're coming from, but I like just to not have Cody. Well, you're right. Show me. I need. I would also need to see the nine other names above him. Agreed. Agreed. Um, with that said, I mean, that, is there anything else really to say about Kobe? I mean, it, obviously, well, not, for, not for you and I, no. no, I mean, you know, like we, we were NBA fans for those we, who, who knew him and, and the stories that will follow for years and, and, and hopefully decades to come, then, then yeah, those people need to continue to tell those stories I agree, and, and, and write about them. And, and I can't wait to, to read about them. And learn about them and hear them. I'm with but you. but for you and I, no, I don't. I don't know. If there's anything else you can say. I, I I will tell you. So I am, and this this you know this could be a just a an awful thing about me. Life, I see life just completely different than a lot of people sometimes. And I was like, Kobe was a mega star. He was a rock star in this world. He was doing nothing but positive things, and that seemed like it was awesome. But at the end of the day, a 41 year old man died. And he lived an unbelievable life at 41. Like, while this is sad and it's shocking, I save the word tragic for things that I find greatly, truly tragic because I don't want to waste it. I don't want to dumb it down. I don't yeah. want to lose its meaning. I think, I think then, his daughter. And then when the like, report of his daughter yeah. being on the plane, on the, on the helicopter, my, I mean, my heart sunk. And I was just like, that, okay, now, now the definition of tragedy is here in full effect. I, I think, I mean, it, it was going to be tragic regardless because, you know, he's a father. Uh, whether she was on the plane or not, um, you know, he's got other daughters at home. Uh, his wife. Man, people people you know, grow up without dads all the time, though. Agreed. And he lived an unbelievable life. Now, I'm not I'm not saying it's okay for somebody to die at 41. I'm not. Agreed, agreed. Jesus, I'm a few years away from being 41. I don't want that. I'm, I'm just trying to say that tragic things are different than sad things that are just completely shocking. That's a, okay. That's a good point. Okay. That, that makes and, sense. And, and if he was alone on this plane or helicopter with a pilot and they were both, you know, 40, 50 year old men who live, obviously if you're a pilot from private jets, have a pretty good life. You've got some stories that are going to be told about you and you're going to live on forever. Like, okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's going to be awful for the people that knew you and they're, they're sad and their world is shaken. But then when his 13 year old daughter is gone too, it's just okay. All right, now, now I'm now I move to a point of of feeling something greater than I was expecting to feel today. I uh, I completely understand. I understand where you're coming from. Uh, let's move on to some football talk for a little bit. Uh, only one topic that that we really want to hit today: um, college football. Gus Malzahn has turned over the play calling duties to Chad Morris. Uh, first off. Does this surprise you at all? No, I think Chad Morris is, is a is a pretty good offensive minded guy. Okay, I don't I don't think this is he's not handing this over to to some schmo that that you know has never you know been successful in in major college football calling plays. All right, at the end of the day, he's going to have you know end all be all say all on on the offense. But I, I think it's okay, and I think what this is Gus doing is. He's he's trying to fill out the rest of the team. He's trying to become more of I got to I got to be a bigger part of recruiting. I've got to be a bigger part of what's going on on special teams and the defense. And I would venture to to say I would watch Auburn special teams this year. Usually, when head coaches who are normal schemers give up the scheming of something and they go to be more of a CEO guy. The only thing that they try to really get creative with is special teams. And so it wouldn't surprise me if Gus does that and just spends a lot more time in that world. And, uh, and yeah, I mean. Um, my my I, first yeah. thought with this was I, I wonder if, if this is part of the reason why Auburn fans, uh, it, it seems, are really tired of Gus. Um, because there's no real plan. Like it, some years he's the play caller, some years he's not, and it's just kind of all over the board. Now this is a, a really mediocre, mild story that that doesn't seem to be a big deal. Because obviously, you know, who wouldn't trust Chad Morris with their offense? And I think that Morris and Malzahn 
come from the same kind of background. They're both, you know, from that high school tree. And and obviously he did great things at Clemson. He did great things at SMU. Uh, the way it ended at Arkansas obviously did not go well. But I, I wonder because he doesn't just set – like if if he were moving towards being a CEO and this was still early in the process for him, then I could understand it. Uh, but we're moving into year what is it eight of him being a head coach? Yeah, and but his staff evolves all the time. What right, you are, right. what you are with one staff is going to completely change based on who your other participants in that staff are. Agreed. And last year, like Kenny Dillingham coming in as the offensive coordinator from Memphis, Dillingham had not called plays. No, so obviously I, no. you wouldn't want well, him to call plays. And then we had it, – it, it's not a I want to have play, call plays. I, I think if he was losing OCs to head coaching jobs or to the NFL or to bigger jobs, promotions, yeah, then, then, then we wouldn't be so critical. But the reason he goes back and forth from calling plays to not calling plays, and usually when he takes over calling plays, that OC gets fired because – he does. He's trying to groom these other coaches to 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 be better at this. I think that's a good thing for a coach to do is to teach those that are working under you your craft and try to help them get to that next level. Now, if they're not successful at the end of the day, you're responsible for the team. Yeah. So you got to push that guy away and you got to take over the reins. And he's able to do that on offense. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. So I don't see this as a negative where he goes back and forth and back and forth from doing it because it's never – It's I don't, I don't think it's a thing where there's no plan. I think there's absolutely a plan. There's always a plan. The problem is, is if the guy sucks, then you got you to gotta move on from the plan. Agreed. As, uh, Dillingham was known for his uh, ability to put together a scheme, put together a game plan, but not necessarily call the plays. And, like He could script plays with the best of them. Um, but e- even when he was at Memphis under Norvell, he was not the play caller. Norvell was no. the play caller. Uh, and I, it was the same thing at Auburn. He went to Auburn, and Gus called the plays, but Dillingham put together the game plans. And, and handing the, the offense to Chad Morris and changing that now is no no big deal to me at all. I, I think you're probably right. I mean, Chad is established. He is. Yeah. He, he will not have any problem finding a job uh, at, at any point in his career, I don't believe. No. No. So, um, with that said, we weren't going to spend long on that. Let's uh, let's close out. Obviously, this will be a short one tonight. You and I are getting together again on Monday night. We'll uh, we'll do our Super Bowl preview. We'll talk uh, several other topics that we're wanting to hit on. Um, but right now, let's move into college basketball. Um, lots of stuff happened over the weekend, of course. The Big Twelve SEC Challenge. Uh, ended up tied five to five. And did you watch any of these games, by the way? Yeah, I wa- well, I watched the LSU uh, Texas game. So that's the the first thing I do. Not the first thing. How about this? Let's pull up the and I and I and I, just to finish that thought, I I checked in a lot on the Baylor Florida game a whole lot. Uh, so. Now I did watch that. I watched Alabama and Kansas State. I watched uh, the majority of LSU Texas, and uh, I watched on another TV, uh, Kentucky and Texas Tech. So I went and looked up highlights, actively searched out, not just watched them on the 3 P Sports Center or whatever, uh, the Auburn, um, Iowa State stuff. I have a, yeah. I have a, a friend of our family is now a, a freshman at Auburn. She was all – she got there in the fall. Okay. And uh, she was one of the students waiting in line for tickets for the game. And Bruce Pearl comes out and is passing out bagels. And she got to meet him and get her picture taken and all that stuff. So. <laughs> It's, it, it is a really cool thing what he does there. Uh, well, no, he's an, he's an exceptional coach. I, yeah. And a great that, person. That's one of those situations where if you could go back in time, you know, I stood firm on, on Ole Miss. If I was Ole Miss, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have fired you. I'd have just made him take whatever suspension he gets and then keep on rolling. With, with Bruce Pearl in Tennessee, Tennessee is just so – Listen, I mean, they, they made the Sweet 16 last year, so I mean, no, no, and that, not, not that they're never going to be good again. I just find him incredibly likable. I find oh, yeah. him incredibly likable. Well, and I, I do think that uh, Tennessee definitely would have been better had they just kept him yep. and had an interim for however just, just long. Just ride, ride this thing out however long it is because yeah. he is he is good, he is likable, he's going to always have your fan base. 
pumped, which is a big part of college basketball. Yeah. Big part. These arenas aren't real big. And so you, you get, you know, 10,000 students and, and people, I guess, let's say under the age of 30 in that place and all of these places, they get crazy and they get really tough places to play. Yes. Yes. And they he do. understands that. And he always has. Yes. No, you're, you're a hundred percent right. I can't have this place filled with 50 year olds. Agreed. I appreciate the money. I appreciate the sport. There are tickets for you, but I need this lower bowl to be full of 29 students. and under people making bad decisions and willing to be crazy. Yes. Uh, Alabama beats Kansas state. Baylor beats Florida. Uh, Kentucky beats Texas Tech on the road. Uh, West Virginia beats Missouri. Auburn beats Iowa State. LSU wins on the road at Texas. Oklahoma wins at home by one over Mississippi State. Kansas had way more of a struggle with Tennessee than anybody thought. Uh, I think DeSosa being gone is yeah. Is I was about to say they they had several guys miss this game. And so well, it, only only two. Only two guys, but and one really doesn't play that much. But uh, I, well, is a big okay, guy. I thought it was three, but one of them was a bench guy. But maybe there was only two. Jesus. Yeah, it was, it that, was only two. Yeah, that's not a big deal at all. Um, Oklahoma State clobbered Texas A and M. A and M's got a lot of building to do with. Uh, yeah, with they're Texas. they're just not real good right now. Uh, Arkansas has looked really really good um, under Eric Musselman. I mean he's yep. he's been fantastic. So they uh, they beat TCU, and then uh, outside of that Big Twelve SEC challenge. Uh, Ole Miss won at Georgia by 10, and South Carolina clobbered Vanderbilt. Uh, everybody is clobbering Vanderbilt right now. Yeah. Uh, the game a- I wanted to watch and I missed was the TCU-Arkansas game. That yeah. That's the game that I wanted to see more of and, and pay more attention to, and I just got busy. And- that's, hey, it's a long day. Saturdays are long, and there's, you know, there were 143 basketball games on Saturday. Yeah, there's, I mean, yeah, there's like 300 schools in college basketball. Yeah, it's, it, it, it took me so long to go through these numbers and pick out 10. Now, I went 6-4 and four against the number. There um, you go. But, and I went 3-0 and today, so I, I've had a pretty good weekend. But, uh, but that, I mean, that took forever to go through those numbers to figure out what games I wanted to bet. Um, the, the most impressive win of the week. And and I think of the weekend across the nation was Baylor hanging on to uh, to that number one spot and kind of going down to Gainesville and beating the hell out of Florida. I mean, they beat them by eleven, and it it really wasn't that close. Sometimes you can beat a team bad on the scoreboard, but really it was a tight game. And then they get to the foul situation; you hit all your fouls, and and you're shooting hail mary threes. And and a game can look squirrely at the end where it really wasn't. This game was kind of a ten point game the entire time. It, Baylor is without They're a really doubt really good. Uh, yeah, I mean they are incredible, and it as an Alabama basketball fan, it drives me insane uh, because their leading scorer, the the guy that leads their team, Jared Butler, uh, was an Alabama commit, an Alabama signee, and ended up transferring. So, you know, it is what it is, right? Like it, it's just irritating, but you know. And you you learn, really as an good. Alabama basketball fan, you learn to deal with these things. Like Anthony Grant has a top ten team at Dayton of all places, yeah. and he couldn't get it done at Alabama. It's like, okay, well, I, it's par for the course, par for the yeah. course. So I wanted to talk to you about LSU and Texas, not yeah. necessarily about the game, but Texas is like I think Shaka Smart may be in trouble. They are twelve and seven right now. Um, I'll just I'll be point blank. Do you think Shaka Smart is the coach at Texas next year? That I don't know the answer to. Um, I, I will tell you this: he has already missed more NCAA tournaments in his first four years. This is his fifth year. He missed two NCAA tournaments in the first four years. Rick Barnes was the coach there for seventeen years, only missed the tournament one time. Well, I, I think I think they are going to regret letting Rick Barnes go. I think they already do. I, well, yes, they obviously already do. That when when that happened, I was shocked. I mean, I was like mouth dropped. You're talking about a class guy in the in the world of college basketball. I'll, I'll tell you this. So the reason why they let him go was that, like he obviously never made a Final Four there. Um, he he never uh, really who got. Who thinks Texas is a basketball school? Final Fours are hard. We just talked about how there's 300 schools in this damn thing, and you want to be a top four. 
I agree. That's you can't what even I'm, be a top four in football, and that's where you put all your money. That's what I'm saying. As a coach, when you get there year after year after year, you would think that a fan base would be fine with that. So Herb Sendek, uh, I don't know if you remember that name. He was the coach at North Carolina State forever and constantly took them to the NCAA tournament. I mean, it was, it was something crazy, like eight out of nine years at NC State. And obviously at NC State, you are at best – the the third best basketball school in that state, and and that's not that's if you don't include Wake Forest and Wake. Forest I was just I was just about to say I'm I'm gonna bet Wake Forest would have something to say about that compared right. to and that's NC what I, State. That's what I'm saying. At best, they are the third best in that state, and Herb Sendak got them there all the time, and they were never happy with him because he couldn't advance. Like he he would advance to like the second round and maybe a Sweet 16, but he wouldn't get further than that, and they got irritated and wanted to bring it. Now, of course, they get rid of him. They bring in Mark Godfrey. Godfrey gets him to, like, an Elite Eight. You know, it's I mean, it's just ridiculous. Again, former Alabama coach. It, it's, it's one of those things where just people's expectations is the cause of all of their problems. Yeah. What, what is you your know? definition of happiness? Yeah, it's, it's expectations minus reality. Yeah. So, a reality so minus expectation. Reality right? minus expectation. Whatever. It's, yeah. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you're getting the same thing. Exactly. But you, you get rid of guys that are good enough to get you there every year. You think you're supposed to be something. You think because you're the biggest school in the state with more money, more power, more influence, that it's your God-given birthright to be better than everybody at everything. And it's just yeah. not the truth. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Uh, Texas Tech lost at home to Kentucky. Um which obviously not a bad loss whatsoever, but no. that comes on the heels of losing at TCU. Uh, Texas Tech might be in danger of missing the NCAA tournament. They don't have. I could, I could see that they lost a lot, but Kentucky's a good basketball team. They they yeah. had a tough draw in in you know who they got in this in this little round robin that we played. Well, and they they do that based on last year's results, and that's right. That's, that's the way no, it goes. I get how they get it, but I'm just saying. You know, you're Texas Tech. You're not Kentucky. Kentucky reloads with new freshmen that are all going to be, you know, five lottery picks every year. And you're Texas Tech. You take three or four years to build a team that can compete. I will which say means this. the year after you make your run, usually going to be pretty rough. Yes. Uh, now, Chris I, so that Beard, exp- I, you know, I don't. They took them to overtime. I thought that was great. I thought it was yeah. a really exciting game. Watch the finish, and 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 so yeah. Their, their only problem right now is that they don't have any real quality wins. Like, that's the biggest issue, and that would have been uh, a big one for them. Well, it would have been huge. Um, but the, their big win before, I think, was Virginia. Or, no, 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 they beat Louisville. That's that's their one win. Like, their yeah. one quad one win. Uh, other than that, they've really got nothing on the resume, and that's, you know, they need, well, still, they need something Still big. a little bit more to go. Still oh, yeah, a little we, more to go. I mean, we're still at the end of January, man. We are all good. We are all yeah. good. Uh I wanted to talk about Michigan and Ohio State. Two te- Before we get out of here, okay. these are two teams that were in the top five me, back in December. There. And Ohio State was the number one team in the country for a bit. And Ohio State has lost, what is it, seven out of ten? I mean, they, they are not good right now. They yeah, they, they fall on Well, They get a win I over think, Northwestern this weekend. I, I think like, the whole Big Ten is drunk as hell. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, home teams win like eighty percent of the time uh, yep. in that conference. It's if, it's if there's absurd. a home dog, I'm betting money line almost every week, and I don't care where they're playing or what the two teams are. I'm just taking my chances with with catching plus you know two eighty three thirty something like that, and yeah. and hoping I can pull the win out. And and I just need them to be a you know okay. I mean, they're they're better than five hundred right now almost. Yeah, it's it's insane. They're way better than that, I believe. Um, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy. To think about. Now, this, you think home dogs are better than 500? Uh, right now, yeah, the Big Ten, like you said, the Big Ten is drunk, man. No, they it is drunk nuts. as hell. It is drunk uh, as hell. Now, this weekend, it didn't quite hit. Um, you know, you, you had Illinois win at Michigan. You yeah, that was on Ohio the road. State win at Northwestern. You had Maryland win at Indiana. Um, I mean, just you had a bunch of stuff this weekend. Uh, Michigan State won at Minnesota today, I believe. So, yeah, you had a lot of road teams win this weekend. But, uh, yeah, for the most part, yeah, home dogs have, uh, have shown up big uh, so far. So far. Uh, but Michigan and Ohio State, 
now 11th and 12th in the Big Ten. Yeah, uh, yeah I was going to say, I'm, I'm, I was pulling up the standings and stuff for the Big Ten. Yeah. At, they're, they're both in, in danger of missing the NCAA tournament after being ranked in the top five earlier this year. Yeah, they seven and eight losses. Yeah. Okay, it, it, it is such a fluid situation. Michigan is 0 and 5 on the road. Oh, yeah. And, and they hadn't been great at home. They're 2 and 6 in the conference. One team in the conference has a winning record on the road 4 and 3, Illinois. Yeah. Which is everybody Brad, else? Brad has a, oh no! Michigan State's only two and three. They have they've they've played one less road game. Yeah, everybody else is below five hundred on the road, which is absolutely insane, right? That's, that's bad. <laughs> and a whole lot of one and six, one and five, zero oh and seven, zero oh and five, one and four. I mean, Rutgers is you know fifteen and five overall. Yeah, they're Rutgers is going to make the NCAA tournament, man. Yeah, they're going to make the tournament. They're one and four on the road though. Like, can't win a road game. What are these teams going to do when they get to? The t- I'm going to tell you this. I might, I might pick a whole lot of, whole lot of upsets for the Big Ten in, in weekend one. I'll tell you this. the The reason I would tell you to hold off on that is because they are playing really good teams. Like the Big Ten is by ranking at, at Ken Palm, yeah. uh, the toughest conference in the entire country. Now, yeah, they, I don't, they may I don't not think have. That's, I don't national, think that's questionable. I but, agree with that. And they may not have a national title contender in there. But it is just a bunch of really good teams all uh, thrown I'm in together. St- I'm still gonna have I'm still gonna have uh, the Spartans doing what I normally do, yeah, which is just write them into the to the Final Four and then figure out the rest of the bracket later. They've uh, I mean they've got so much experience. I mean it's yep. just a ton of experience. I, I, I don't just, I just the- trust that team. I don't know yeah. anything about anything else. I, I just trust I trust those guys. I trust that coach. Uh, do we want to talk at uh, at all about Memphis? Yeah, Memphis is in trouble. I mean, they, they they the big wins that they had early in the season do not look so hot anymore. I mean, Ole Miss is not good. Tennessee, it, eh, whatever. I mean, it's a road win and it's a it, I think it's a quad one at this point, but it it ain't you know it ain't great. Um, Memphis losing by forty the other night. We talked about that. Got just destroyed. And, and then they get to come home. And they give up a 15-0 run to end the game and lose by four at home to SMU. Now, SMU is a pretty good basketball team. They're 15-4 and four on the season, but you cannot lose that you, game. You got home. a double-digit lead like this. You can't blow that. No. not You not can't blow half. that, man. At home? Um, do, do we think that this still has something to do with, uh, with the locker room? I don't I don't know. I don't know. I think some of it has to do with coaching. I, mean, I just don't know that you blow those kind of leads. Great coaches don't have that happen to them, ever. They'll go their entire career. They'll coach thousands and thousands of games. They won't have that happen to them. You, I think you're probably right. I think you're right. Like This is this is an interesting thing to watch. I cannot wait to see the end of the season. Uh, to see. I mean, I love Pitt. I want watch. nothing but good things for him, but damn. I, don't, I, don't, I, just, I just don't know that he's – can he recruit? Yes, we all knew that. Well, we'll we'll see if he can continue to recruit. Uh, well, okay, true. He, he had a lot of help uh, with James Wiseman talking to these guys that are now on the team. Uh, Fact. I'm curious what it's going to be like when he is not recruiting guys that are in Memphis that already know. Like, I think he can recruit Memphis. Well, I, but that's the thing, though. I mean, there's enough. I think there's enough local talent in Memphis every year for you to have a a top 15 recruiting class just to just if you got the local kids you might be right you might be right. i mean i just think i think there's a couple of hotbeds for talent in basketball that have been there forever i think memphis and dc are two of the most underrated places in the country oh a hundred percent yeah it, for, it, for talent DC and if you could just recruit locally then 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 you're not really worried about anybody else you, you but might at some point right. we got to develop these kids I mean, you got to take a three star and make them play like a four star. You just do. Yeah, yeah. You not, have to. Not see, you, have the, you have one of the best NBA shooters in the history of the game. Somebody has to teach these kids how to shoot the basketball. Yeah, I mean, it's. I will say this: that is a learned skill. Boogie Ellis uh, came out of his shell early in that game, and and was playing pretty well, and and then nothing. Like they did just. Because you can shoot your way. When they get down, like the other night, they got down by like 15 pretty quick. You can shoot your way out of holes like that. Yeah. But you have to be able to shoot the basketball. The three-point 
is so important to the game now. If you don't have it, you can't compete. And they've and so their biggest thing is that they don't have any bigs down low to be able to open up the the outside shots. Uh, when they had Wiseman, it was a different thing, right? Because Dude, name name a big man that's played for Villanova in the last ten years. You got a valid point, but you but, can run a scheme with nothing but little dudes. I swear to God, Villanova's thrown out there nothing but five guards. But that's year that's, after year after year, and they moonwalk their ass to the elite eight. But that's when you've got five guys that can all shoot the three. Memphis At has, some point in time, you can teach these kids how to do this. Now they might not be able to do it as freshmen, but as long as they're not one and done guys, they need to be learning how to shoot the basketball. And if next year we can do it then great. It was all worth it, whatever the hell we went through this year. But if next year these kids come back and they can't shoot the three, then we have a problem. Yeah, you might be right. You might be that right. That is a learned skill. That is not something that you were magically born with. They need to have their asses out there practicing this stuff. And and we got the best shooting coach in the – who should be one of the best shooting coaches in the business. I mean, he's one of the best shooters, so you would, you well, would think he'd be able I'm to I'm hoping it. that he can teach his technique and it wasn't some weird, I have a weird shot. And whatever, so yeah. No, you're right. He's got a pretty pure shot. Yeah, you, a hundred percent. You you weren't going to find a better shooter than uh, than Mike Miller. I, I think I think he can teach that skill to. I would I would think he could teach that skill to somebody. You are probably right. And it's just practice and repetition over and over and over again. <laughs> you're uh, you're dead on. So that is going to wrap up the show for this evening. Uh, we appreciate you guys hanging in. Of course, rest in peace, Kobe Bryant. Uh, you can yep. go back and watch the beginning of that if uh, if you're only catching this segment of it on YouTube. Um, yeah, I think that's going to do it. Go over to winningcureseverything.com. Check out all of our stuff over there, everything about us, our picks, everything else. Our college basketball, my college basketball picks are on the site. I do it every day. Uh, I give you my picks. I went 3-0 and today, went 6-4 and yesterday. Uh, not every day is going to be this successful, but I am uh, almost at 58% on the season. So uh, we have made uh, we've made some cheddar. We're doing all right. Um, go over to tunicatravel.com. Of course, Tunica, Mississippi is the South's premier sports gambling destination. All of their sports books, we vouch for them. They are fantastic. Uh, Tunica's got great stuff going on. Go check out more information on them over at tunicatravel.com. Chris, we are going to be doing this again tomorrow night, my friend. Sir. Absolutely. We'll see you all again later. Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us.